on, on site and online, huh, we uh, we have taken the habit now to do uh, hybrid events. So um, thank you very much for coming and uh, for those who are online, thank you very much for um, for watching us. So uh, we have um, a long day in a way because it's a double event uh, which is organized by uh, the think tank CER but also by a, a series of academics uh, led by Justice Baron um, in the afternoon. So in the morning, uh, we will focus mostly on uh, standardization in general um, and uh, the, the, the new strategy uh, of the European Commission. Uh, and we will discuss um, a report by uh, Justice Baron and Pierre Larouche, um, two academics, um, on um, their view of this standardization strategy. Uh, then we will have a lunch and then uh, we will zoom in, in a way, on the uh, standard essential patent. Uh, as we all know, I mean, the Commission has come with an important proposal last week and uh, those proposals will be um, discussed in the afternoon. But in the morning, we will focus on the uh, standardization strategy uh, in, in general. Okay, so just to be, to be, to be clear on what we will um, what we will discuss. So um, for this morning session, uh, we are uh, very pleased to have Sophie Muller, uh, who um, is uh, one of the brain behind that strategy. Um, she will have uh, some opening remark of um, 10 minutes, and then uh, MEP uh, Adam Bilen, uh, who is um, um, a rapporteur at the European Parliament on that strategy for another 10 minutes uh, for opening remark. Uh, then uh, uh, Pierre and Justice will present uh, their report, which is available on the website of uh, CER. Um, and then we will discuss uh, that report uh, with um, different stakeholders uh, from um, the standardization organization, uh, from the industry, and then from the institution. Uh, so in um, the, the collaborative spirit of SARA, we always like to have um, the different stakeholders in a way around the table, a, a bit like a standardization process in a way. Um, and then we will uh, uh, finish at 12.45, have a lunch, and then the second part of the day uh, will, uh, will start at 1.30. Okay, so um, let me, let's start with Sophie. Uh, again, thank you very much for your time. I imagine how busy you should be. Um, so for some uh, opening remark on, um, on the standardization strategy. Okay, I press here, good. Hello everybody, well first of all, thank you for the event. I don't think we had so many standardization events, <laughs> uh, whether it's in the parliament or uh, with private actors in the last 12 months uh, before. I will mainly uh, speak today about the European standardization strategy, the system, and then in the end also go uh, into some of the points that we saw in the report. Um, first of all, I've been in Stockholm two days ago at the Single Market Forum. Um, you know, we are celebrating 30 years of the Single Market uh, this year. Uh, the Single Market for Goods, for Services, Capital, and um, People. And uh, some of the high-level speakers there were talking of uh, the single market being the diamond of European integration. And in a breakout session in the afternoon on standardization, I think we all agreed that if the single market is a diamond, then the European standardization system is one of the crown jewels. I'm not picky. It can be a sapphire. It can be a ruby or an emerald. But... Um, for us, we would not have the single market that we have today if we would not have the European standardization system the way that we know it. So um, I think this is my first message, and this is also, um, that was a starting point of the European standardization strategy last year, that <coughs> we, want to, we wanted to show a very strong commitment to the European standardization system that we have um, through our European strategy. Now, we have a very peculiar system. We have a system where we have built a public-private partnership between the European Commission, between the European standardization organizations, between the variety of stakeholders from industry, big, small, uh, academia, civil society uh, representation, um, to really deliver also, also standards that support our legal acquis. We have almost 3,700 standards cited in the official journal. 
And I can say with confidence that we don't have a similar system in the world where you have this strong legal standing um, of <coughs> standards within a legal context. So this would be my first message today. It is a great success in our view, but we cannot take it for granted and we need to constantly work on it. So when we developed the strategy last year, we also had a perspective of the future. So we're building a green digital and resilient single market. We're going through a profound transformation, an industrial transformation. And from a policy perspective, we have put a lot of proposals on the table, artificial intelligence, data, cyber resilience, batteries, hydrogen, net zero emissions, critical raw materials, the list is very long. These are all new proposals. So uh, these are proposals, um, policies that we did not uh, enter into before. And, you know, while this future transformation will, of course, depend on the money, will, of course, depend on the regulation, we are very conscious that it will also depend on European standards or international standards. It will depend on the technical specifications to roll out the new technology, to have measurement me methods, to have quality uh, standards on all of these new technologies that will really change the industry we know today. My second message today is um, that why we really, really fully support the system, uh, we are faced with tremendous challenges that we need to face. And the first is, and this is also described in the strategy, we're having a much faster and much more challenging technology development. Um, the developments are not the same like in five to ten years ago. And that also comes with a different nature of standards. So they are not only more technological challenging, and yes, they remain very technical, but we are also seeing more and more a fundamental rights dimension in these standards, be it you can see it in our Artificial Intelligence Act, be it in the Data Act, where um, we are very well aware, and we have these discussions about uh, ChatGTP at the moment, um, that the deployment of these technologies also will come with challenges in the factory for the worker, um, when we use our phones, and all of this is underpinned by technical standards. So if we say or if we make that commitment that the Artificial Intelligence Act, the implementation will very much be underpinned by these technical standards, also the way we develop these standards is changing because these technical experts obviously will have to respect um, in that development process some uh, newer dimensions. We are also faced with a completely changed international context. Um, the EU is still a powerhouse in standardization, but for very legitimate reasons, we cannot uh, blame anyone, there is strong global competition. We have a lot of more actors, um, and not all regions um, follow the same approach as us. Many regions couple this with a strong industrial policy agenda. And we had some wake-up calls at international level that just made us realize uh, that we cannot be complacent and that we need to really build an even stronger public-private partnership between uh, the public authorities and the stakeholders. Now, um, linking to that, when we crafted our standardization strategy last year, and I know your report sees this a little bit different, um, the dimension of civil society in academia, in addition to big and small industry, was very important for us because we see this as an added value in the standards development. Um, we are all longing technical experts in any case, so we need to have the best technical expertise um, around the table when we develop these standards. And we do think that, um, that all spectrums of society shall and should and actually can contribute. Now, um, 
coming to my third point, what are we actually doing about all of this? <laughs> so I think we all share a similar problem analysis, but what are we actually doing? I think the number one priority here is really to oil the machine. Um, the machine room are, is the standardization system. We need to make it more efficient. We need to be more aligned or at least have a very strong dialogue. And we need to anticipate better. These, with these very fast technology developments, we need to start the dialogue about what we expect from a policy perspective to implement our legislation and how the technical community can accompany this process much earlier on than we did in the past. Now, another point here is that, and this is very much the line of my commissioner, Commissioner Breton, who has been, as you know, in several boardrooms or at the head of boardrooms, he really believes that standards are of such strategic importance that they belong in the boardrooms. Now, we have established a high-level forum um, to, with executives uh, from European stakeholder um, associations to work together in identifying what from a European, especially industrial transformation point of view, are the key areas that we should invest our standardization efforts in. In the green area and the digital <coughs> area from a resilience perspective, where do we need the standards to renew our industrial base and also how do we tackle these challenges of um, new, the new dimension of uh, technology standardization, for example, the fundamental rights dimension, or how do we also link ourselves up better to the international level. We also nominated a chief standardization officer. Um, we try to get our own house in order. And then when it comes to the European standardization system as such, because we believe so much um, in the fabric of our European base with the national standardization bodies, but also to have the biggest representation of all societal actors in the process, uh, we made the legal amendment uh, to really streamline the decision-making and adoption process for standards at the request of the European Commission in all three European standardization organizations. Now, for us, also the link to international standardization, of course, is absolutely key. Um, I think when it comes to how we are positioned, we are very, very well positioned. We have Elena here with us, with Sen Senelec and uh, the national standardization bodies which are all part of the international standards development. Etsy has a, an MOU with uh, the International Telecommunications <coughs> Union. And then there are also a lot of cooperation agreements, uh, either with IEC and ISO and some uh, other standards bodies or even with Sensenelec. So um, whenever we can, and sometimes we are accused of becoming Fortress Europe or whatever, um, we want to go international because we do see that it is becoming an increasingly important technical barrier to trade. We see the data uh, coming from Brazil or from Australia or from uh, other regions in the world where standards are used um, for their um, domestic markets. And here, um, whenever we can, we will, of course, support the WTO recognize three international standardization organizations, which are ITU, ISO, and IEC. This is reflected in all our FTA negotiations, um, whether you look into the FTA agreements with Japan or Singapore or Canada, now Australia, New Zealand. We are really trying to have a commitment that we want to work within these international bodies. Um, we're having a technology and trade council with the United States, which does not have the same uh, catalog as us when it comes to international and uh, European standards. But there is a very good cooperation ongoing, and I think um, we're getting somewhere. And also, of course, with Japan, China, or other regions. And then we're trying to connect more to the pre-normative uh, side, that is for us to really make the most out of our funding. Uh, but then I think the last point that I really want to stress is skills, skills, skills. We can write the most beautiful papers, the best strategies, the best uh, intentions. 
if we do not have the best people in these technical committees, we will not succeed in having the best standards on whatever we need for hydrogen, 5, 6G, you name it. So this is a big challenge for Europe from an industrial uh, point of view, from a public authorities point of view, and uh, we're looking at various avenues to improve that. Now, my last point or part that I want to address is a bit what also was uh, mentioned in the report, because there are a lot of critical elements, of course, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the system. Now, the first thing that I want to stress is we are now evaluating our regulation, which sets the framework for how this public-private partnership is working from various elements. And um, it's a carte blanche. So we will, of course, take any inputs uh, into account uh, that are, you know, that we need to improve or maybe we need to even completely revolutionize the system. Now, the first part that I want to um, highlight is, or to clarify <coughs> from our point of view, is the legal status of harmonized European standards. Now, harmonized European standards are not just European standards or technical specification. They remain a voluntary standard, but they have a legal effect. Now, sometimes what the court, the European Court of Justice has said, that they are part of EU law, is presented as they were EU legislation. If they were EU legislation, we would have a full-blown co-decision adoption process with the Parliament and the Council also having to give its okay for these standards. But they are not. But they are part of the acquis. If they weren't, we would not have the presumption of conformity across 30 European markets. Now, this legal effect requires some sort of validation uh, from a policy point of view. And the co-legislators have decided to give this validation uh, to the European standardization organizations and to the European Commission. And the court has said it is a role of the European Commission to initiate, to manage, and to validate these harmonized European standards. Now, one can argue about how we do this, I would agree, we are a bureaucracy. Most likely, uh, we are not the most easy or the easiest uh, stakeholder always. But those of you who work in a big company, you also know your legal compliance department. You know how your own decision uh, structures are managed. And it is very similar to us, so we have our procedures. And um, our job is just to check that these standards comply with the EU legislation. And also given the challenges we have ahead, this is important to us. We are not going to compromise a technical solution if in artificial intelligence it might affect workers' rights. Or we had a case um, you know, where the safety of toys uh, was not guaranteed. We are not going to compromise this because it works for the EU citizen in the end. Now, are we blocking with this approach the overall standards development. I guess, you know, I sometimes try to put myself into the shoes of a technical expert in a technical committee. And I would hate the European Commission, and I would probably also hate the Haas consultants. Because, of course, you come with your technical expertise, you come, you're in a very difficult negotiation around the table, you're trying to build a consensus, and suddenly there's this Haas consultant and says, I'm sorry, but this is not compliant with Article X, Y, Z, and where's your Annex Z, and you haven't done your job properly. Obviously, not a very welcome contribution. However, we know that it's needed, because if we look back, we had a backlog of almost 600 standards which we did not cite in the official journal because they weren't compliant with our law. This is the worst case scenario. You work three, four years, you put all your efforts in, you finish your work, and then the European Commission sits there and sits there and tells you, we're very sorry, but we can't cite it. It's not in line with our law. This is why we deployed the system. This is why we thought, okay, let's bring consultants in 
which follow an independent recruitment process, which often come from technical committees or sometimes are even from our colleagues. And we want them to come in earlier, to flag issues early on, so we are on the same page. We had difficult lessons to learn. I'm not saying that it was easy, but our adoption rate went up. It doesn't mean that we can do better, and Elena and uh, Sen Senelec and Etsy have worked for, with us for one and a half years now to really try to make it better. We are now piloting a lot of solutions, and we will really hope that we can manage a system which in the end shall facilitate the life of the technical experts and maybe the commission official. But um, in the end, we want, this is our end game. And our end game is also that we really want to have as many standards cited in the official journal as possible. Because in the end, I mean, thinking of SMEs, they don't have a big compliance department. They cannot do 30 type approval procedures in Greece, in Spain, in Norway, in uh, Lithuania. But they can hopefully do one compliance test with a harmonized standard. And this is what we need to keep in mind when we think about the European standardization system. We also need to keep in mind that this can open international markets if we keep that international mindset. And this is what we're trying to do. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for this um, very clear um, explanation of your strategy and what you want to do. Uh, we can take one or two questions. If there are, you have a mic in, um, in fact, in your uh, seat or next to your seat. You can open the les accoudoirs, as we say in French, and then you have a mic there. Um, so I don't know if there are some questions uh, for Sophie. Anyway, she, she's staying during the, the panel. I'm so, not going anywhere. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but I mean, if there are some burning questions, uh, you can take one. No. Uh, okay, so let's go to the Parliament now. Um, so uh, to um, the Member of Parliament, uh, Bilen, I don't see him on the screen, so I don't know if... Um, yes, mm -hmm. I see you there, but I don't know if we can see. Cool. Um, okay, so thank you very much. Um, Adam, for, for joining us. So, um, also, if you can explain a bit your view of uh, what you are doing in the Parliament and what is your view of uh, what the standardization strategy should be uh, in Europe, and also if you have some uh, remark on the report, uh, they are also welcome, but also uh, uh, we can discuss that in the panel um, for uh, around 10 minutes. But thanks very much for joining us. Uh, thank you very much for having me, for having me uh, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests. Uh, it is an honor to be virtual with you today to address the crucial subject that is standardization in the European Union. I am glad to see that this topic is increasingly at the heart of the EU's digital and industrial strategy and that it is finally receiving the attention it deserves. Uh, the European Union institutions should be working hard to create a single market that is both fair and efficient. Standardization is an essential element to achieve this goal, ensuring that products, uh, services and processes meet essential quality and safety requirements, which are crucial for businesses and consumers. As the rapporteur in the Internal Market Committee for the EU standardization strategy. I look forward to the plenary session in Strasbourg next week, where my report will be put to vote. Now, for those who are not familiar with its details, I was asked to briefly present its main conclusions. My report strives to shed light on and address the strengths and weaknesses of the standardization system in the EU as identified during consultations with uh, different stakeholders. A key issue highlighted in the report concerns the shift of responsibilities between the Commission and the standardization organizations. I firmly believe that stakeholders should lead the process while the Commission plays an active role in highlighting challenges and any divergence from requirements. International cooperation is another critical aspect emphasized in the report. 
to safeguard our global trade dynamics, it is crucial to ensure the prevalence of inclusive, like-minded approaches towards standardization at the international level. This is particularly re relevant for us and our geopolitical partners, such as the US, Canada, and other like-minded economies. The report also underscores the need for reform in the EU standardization process, prompted by delays in adopting standards, a hurdle especially for smaller companies. Our report makes it clear that standards are voluntary tools and should not be overused to impose specific ideas at the technical level when implementing the law. In other words, we emphasize the importance of a market-driven process behind the standards. Moving on, I would like to welcome the publication of this timely and comprehensive report on EU standardization. With its depth of information and analysis, it serves as one of the most exhaustive studies in recent years, affirming the significance of this subject for the European project. While I appreciate the overall analysis, there are some aspects where my opinion differs. Although it is difficult to comment on the report before its formal presentation, I will nevertheless raise a few points on its content. First, let me address the international context. As Ms. Sophie Miller just stated, the global implications of EU standardizations are more critical than ever. That is why I welcome the fact that the report gives some much importance to the international dimension. In an interconnected world, where emerging technologies and pressing challenges like transforming to the green and digital economies, the EU must be agile in its approach to standards development. We should cooperate with major economies and international standardization bodies to tackle global challenges and promote sustainable development. In doing so, we reaffirm our commitment to a more resilient and inclusive market. The report suggests that the Commission's strategy increases political focus within the European standardization system, risking its balance and potentially isolating European standards, leading to further fragmentation within the global standardization landscape. While I believe this statement is quite strong, I also have to admit that to some extent it's true. Recent changes in the approach to standardization, including the trend away from the new approach and delays in the citation of standards in the official journal are causing a great deal of criticism from stakeholder groups, including industry. The report also rightly points out the rising geopolitical tensions around standards. Some other countries use standards to restrict market access, making standards mandatory of or certification compulsory. Although there are voices supporting this trend in the EU, I believe in, it contradicts the principles of a free market economy. Regarding the principle of European standards being free from foreign influence, the report states that this conflicts with the reality of European standardization. Due to, to, to agreements with uh, ISO, SEN and SENELEC, international standards often take precedence over developing European norms, allowing non-European stakeholders to potentially influence decision-making on technical standards. However, I must disagree with uh, such a conclusion of the report. The goal of this approach is to integrate European interests into international standards, bridging the market access gap. Identical standards enable European companies to operate more efficiently in the global market. Moving on to the impact on ESO's ability to compete at the global level, I believe maintaining stakeholder interest in participating in standardization may become a problem in the future. The ex excessive bureaucrat bureaucratization of harmonized standards development, mainly related to assessments 
by Haas consultants and delays or refusal to publish references to standards in official journal is causing frustration among stakeholders, which can already be observed. Second, I would like to focus on interna internal process and representation. The report highlights the need for inclusiveness in standardization, emphasizing the underrepresentation of society, societal interests. The European Parliament agrees and has included measures to address this issue. However, I believe that striving for balanced representation should not compromise the voluntary nature or openness of the process, as everyone has the right to participate. Inclusiveness is essential, but it must be co implemented correctly. Moreover, SMEs, which form the backbone of the European economy, must be well represented in the standardization process. Their involvement is vital for the success of the strategy's global industrial policy dimension, as they need to quickly adapt their plans to the resulting standards. The success of the strategy's global industrial policy depends on SME involvement to quickly adapt and implement the standards. In this context, I would also like to briefly mention the principle of national delegation. In the report, it is presented rather as a limitation in building representativeness. Meanwhile, the current studies emphasize its advantages, the obligation to build consensus at the national level with the participation of all stakeholders, the easy access of weaker stakeholder groups. They can only participate at the national level and their voice will count in determining the national pos position. They can work in their own language. Lastly, I would like to address the four alternatives presented to us to reduce the coupling and prevent fragmentation. Without going into too much detail, I will just say that I believe option three is the best from my point of view. It aligns with the market economy's value, the role of standardization in the economy, maintaining European competitiveness, and preserving the public-private partnership between ESO and EC. This option is most, most appropriate in terms of maintaining stakeholder interests, Europe's role in the global market, and the competitiveness of European industry. Looking ahead, our focus should be on strengthening the EU standardization framework, making it more responsive to the evolving needs of our industries and citizens. The necessity, this necessitates investment in education, research, and capacity building, ensuring that the next generation of Europeans is well equipped with the skills and knowledge necessary to navigate the complex world of standardization. As the report rightly points out, the European Union experienced a new impetus in standardization back in the 1970s. Today, I believe we are at the similar crossroads with the opportunity to revitalize standardization that reflects the rapidly changing global landscape. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bilen, um, for your, um, I mean, um, comprehensive explanation of your report, but also uh, uh, the comment on, uh, on the report that will be presented by Justice and Pierre. But again, I mean, is there some uh, burning question for um, MEP Bilen? Uh, again, I think you will stay also with us uh, for the panel, but um, okay. So if I don't see that, so let's uh, go to the presentation uh, of the report itself. Uh, that has been also, uh, the, we had already some comments from the two <coughs> previous speakers. Um, so Justice and Pierre, um, please go ahead. Okay. So um, I just want to see, if, yeah, the slides are up. So... Um, Welcome uh, to everyone and, and thank you for coming and uh, listening to the presentation of our report. So uh, a few words on uh, what we've done in the report. We have about 20 minutes uh, for what is actually a, quite a long report. Uh, our starting point was the uh, standardization strategy in February. Um, that's the, of course, it was the impetus for the report. Uh, we're both experienced researchers uh, in the area. So my colleague uh, Baron is 
more on the economic side and more on the legal side, but we're used to working together, so we thought this is an interesting uh, uh, development, and we'd like to dig deeper on certain issues. Uh, there's a lot to like in the strategy, and maybe we didn't emphasize it enough in the, the report. Uh, definitely puts uh, standardization uh, back in a more central position uh, in European policy in general, something that can only be welcomed. And you can see that the Commission has its finger on the pulse about the issues that are burning uh, at the moment. Uh, the creation of the high-level forum, the appointment of a chief standardization officer, these are all good developments, more investment in standardization, uh, concern for the next generation of people uh, getting involved in standardization. Uh, so uh, all of this, of course, is most welcome. And we see also, from our point of view, the connection between this document and all the initiatives that were mentioned already uh, in the digital area, the DMA, the DSA, uh, and especially the new, uh, our upcoming AI Act. Um, so uh, we observed all of this, uh, but still we thought hmm, there's a need to uh, look maybe more closely and, and do some more work on uh, especially uh, the second and the third bullet. So that will be the core of our <coughs> presentation, uh, improvements to ESO governance and uh, the uh, geopolitical dimension. So uh, briefly, uh, because the report has just been released, so I, I'm not going to assume that you all read it. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's structured as follows. So we start with a brief history of standardization in Europe. I will not go into this other than to say we do point out also to some of the changes that have been mentioned uh, by Ms. Müller uh, in, the, sorry, in the last uh, decade uh, that um, there's this blurring of the uh, distinction between the ICT and the other sectors, traditional tech. Uh, the move to standards as no longer just a choice of what is the best solution, but standards become constitutive of the technology. Uh, there's a broader set of stakeholders being involved and a blurring also of the distinction between safety or check standards, as we like to call them, safety, health, environment, consumer, and compatibility standards. So in the second part of the report, uh, we outline what is maybe the theoretical foundation for the report, this idea that the st system has this duality built into it, and in, in two ways. Uh, there's a, a dual purpose, so the European standardization system serves to uh, assist EU policy, but also to promote the interests of EU industry. And the system itself has this dual nature. It was presented as a public-private partnership. It has a public dimension. It's governed by this procedural approach, which creates a, a framework, a public law-like framework. Uh, but deep down, there's also the private dimension. It is run by the stakeholders. It is a cooperative endeavor. We like to call it a cooperative endeavor with some competitive checks so the players see what the others are doing. But also, and it's important to point out, a shared commitment. Uh, within, you know, we create with the standardization uh, bodies uh, a forum that is conducive for the private interests to work together towards this uh, shared a commitment to have a standard and to have a standard that reflects the, the values that should be in it. Uh, part three of the report goes deeper into four elements of the strategy, and that's the part where we try to provide extra analysis, extra uh, empirical evidence. Um, so the four points that we chose to work on were the relationship between the ESS and the rest of the world, uh, the idea of the governance of the ESOs and the social interests, uh, including also the influence of multinationals and the balance between the various stakeholders. Uh, point three, the use of European standards to help achieve EU policy goals. And part four, the geopolitical dimension. So I'm not going to say more. Uh, we will focus on the fourth uh, part of the report, which is where we make our assessment with a bit of a critical uh, twist, as you heard. And it has two dimension, it's based on the idea that the strategy can be read narrowly as a document that is concerned first and foremost with reducing frictions in the use of European standards, or it could be read more broadly as a document that seeks to leverage the system to promote EU strategic goals globally. And that's what will come through the next uh, slide. So we'll take you through the main takeaways of the report. Uh, my colleague will start. Yes. 
Thank you very much. So as Pierre alluded to, there is uh, this idea of a narrow reading or a broader reading of the strategy. And we think that for each of these two readings, there are two core themes that apply. So the for one core theme that applies is this concern about the societal balance, the balance between different types of interest <coughs> constituencies that are represented and the way they are represented in standardization. And the other major theme that applies to both these readings is the concern that the Commission voices about the representation of European interests, European players, European values in the development of European standards, but also then uh, at the international stage. And where we begin to take a little bit of a critical approach towards the strategy is the emphasis on the need to govern, to, to reform the governance of European standards organizations because of the uh, implications that European standards have for um, citizens' interests and rights. So let's start with some core principles where we all agree, I think. So we understand that standards have these implications. We understand that standards are critical to uh, very sensitive aspects of, of individuals' rights. And we understand that these uh, implications become more and more salient, more and more sensitive, and perhaps more and more difficult to uh, navigate. And the other thing that we understand and respect is that the idea of the representation of societal interests in standardization is a core defining characteristic of the European standardization system. So these are things that we do not question in any way. Um, where, we, where we see a little bit of a concern is that we think that the strategy not only doubles down on this idea of representation, but also that it changes a little bit the, no, the notion of representation that is applied, and it changes a little bit the, the, the goals and purposes of, of the representation. So we, we've done a lot of historical work about the historical evolution of the European standardization system across different policy cycles. And there is kind of this continuation or uh, almost a tradition of the Commission <laughs> emphasizing the need for social representation and at the same time criticizing the current state of social representation in European standardization. So this goes back to at least three or four decades. And uh, the strategy is, is part of that tradition. So it, it emphasizes the need for social representation. At the same time, it makes this empirical statement about the current state of representation being inadequate. And we start by making several distinctions that, that we think are important and, and that might help clarifying certain things. So first of all, we, we make a distinction between different categories of social interest because in the, in, in the European standardization system, there are four that are explicitly named. So there are the small, medium enterprises, and then there are consumers, there are environmental interests, and there are labor or workers' interests. And we think that the, the, the distinction is crucial between SMEs on the one hand and then the other three on the other hand because SMEs are actors that have particular interests. And by no means all SMEs have the same particular interests and, and, and they also gain, they have competitive interests in being directly participating in standardization. So with respect to SMEs, there has always been a double goal of this representation on the one hand representing their interests, but at the other, on the other hand also and at the same time facilitating their direct participation. Whereas with respect to consumers, workers, and environmental interests, it has always been a matter of representation. Direct representation from these constituencies has always been more limited. And the other thing is that it's more difficult to conceptualize these interests as really distinct groups. We're saying, okay, here in the room, these are the consumers, here are the workers, and these are the people who care about the environment. I mean, this is probably not how it works. I mean, probably these are just facets of the public interest that we all, to some extent, care about. So it's kind of a, it's, it's a, it's a peculiar system to assign a representation of these different facets of the public interest to different representative organizations. It's the way it has been in the European system for quite some time. But I think it's, it's always good to, 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 to rethink about it and how it works. And so what's kind of new in the standardization strategy with respect to, to this notion of representation of social interests, there are two things. First of all, there's a new word that comes up that hasn't been, at least in our reading, in, in policy documents from the Commission about the standardization system before, which is the word democracy. There's this idea that social representation is a way of making the system more democratic. 
And that aligns with criticism that is in the report where, for example, it criticizes that multinational companies have more votes than organizations representing huge swaths of the population. So it's basically about the power that these, these different organizations have in influencing standardization decisions. And that, if we, if we conceive, of the, conceive of representation as representation such as in a representative democracy, obviously it's a problem. It's not representative. It's not democratically representative. Which is different from a notion of representation that has historically been, for example, still in Regulation 1025, it's, it's what we would call an epistemic notion of representation. It's important that somebody raises these issues. It's important that somebody is there to, bring, to, to call attention to the implication that this might have for a certain interest or for a certain constituency. And then once it's on the table, these, con these concerns are addressed just the same way as any other technical objection would be addressed. And um, the other thing that is new is the idea that indirect representation through the national standards bodies is not only superior, but actually the, word, the way it's framed, it's the only <laughs> way that it could possibly be achieved that we have adequate representation of this broad cross-section of social interests, which we think contrasts with what we read in earlier statements and earlier documents, where the commission was actually quite concerned about the state of social representation within the national standards bodies and was quite happy or quite uh, strongly pushed for direct representation of different interests at the European level directly. So it's, we, we understand, we heard from the MEP that uh, it's more difficult for smaller players, weaker players, to participate in English at the international level than participate at the national process. But of course, also, in, also indirect representation has its limitations. And of course, if you think of a minority interest, if, if there is a structural minority, then it's structurally in the minority in every single country. And then the, the likelihood that this structural minority is actually represented at the European level becomes more uh, questioned when, when we rely exclusively or primarily on this, on this system of indirect representation. So what, what we think is, is to return to a notion where the goal of representation is epistemic. The goal of representation is making sure that the people who make decisions about standards, their attention is brought, is called to the issues that matter. Evacuate that notion of democracy which is a notion of a political process. Which is the mo and this notion of democracy leads to this criticism of non-representative distribution of voting powers. We, from, from our understanding, voting powers are there in the statutes, but they are rarely exercised in a, because the goal in, in, any, in any event is consensus. And for consensus, it's not, it's not about making a compromise between the people who are in the room. It's not about voting and the majority takes it away. It's about making sure that every objection has been addressed. So we find that difficult to square with this idea that we need to increase the influence of that category to the expense of the other, or that we, that we should particularly worry about the voting power held by that particular group. And of course, that is not a democratic process. And of course, if we think that it's part of lawmaking, that would not be satisfactory. And of course, these aspects of lawmaking that are proper to the Haas process, proper to the development of this particular subset of European standards that have this particular peculiar legal role in the EU. There is some need of infusion of democracy. At some point, the democracy needs to kick in, right? So we, we can ask, where is the democracy? Where, where comes the democracy? And, and there, it's clear that there are these alternative paths. And I mean, none of them is perfect, and each of them raises concerns. And so there is this idea, OK, the, uh, the commission itself, obviously, through the requests and through the ex post review, is the body that then is responsible for making sure that if there is political considerations, then you need to tell the standardizers what they have to do, what, the, what are the policy objectives that they have to achieve, and then ex post check whether that has been done. And obviously, the public authorities themselves, they are active participants in standardization. They can participate actively as one representative. And that's a different notion of representation that is not export map, where we basically, instead of having like it's one federating organization responsible of representing the social interest or having like these sliced up social interests representing by one particular peculiar group, we can have public authorities themselves participating and representing in, 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 in a greater manner. So the way 
all these, all these options are delicate, and none of that is, is perfect, and we, we understand that the, 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 the way it's approached is, is defensible, but we, we, we think that it's, uh, each of these options entails the risk of uh, decoupling between the process for developing this particular subset of standards, the subset of standards that has this peculiar legal role in the EU, and the other activities of the ASOs. And we think that the way the system is conceived is to say, okay, we make, we, we, we make a compromise. We have an existing set of institutions that has existed before it had this role for the EU. We make use of the expertise that they have. We leverage the expertise that these people have. And in, in return, we, we deal with a process that is not perfectly designed for that particular process. So either we say, okay, let's, let's get away with that, let's design a process that is perfectly designed for that particular process, and then we decouple it from all the other things that they do, and we lose kind of the synergies between the private and the, pro and the public things that they do. Or we deal with the imperfections in the process, and we try to correct whatever dif democracy deficiency or legitimacy deficiency that arises, we correct it at the interface between regulation and, uh, and standards through the Article 10 procedures in the Regulation 1025. So that's with respect to, uh, which one is it? The big so that's with respect to, the, to these governance principles and the notion of representation. And the other one where we have concerns is, is this overarching notion, which is much stronger in the policy statements, in the speeches, on the websites, than in the strategy document itself, uh, where it's said European standards should be decided by European players. So, once again, I mean, there's an element of democracy to that. I mean, if it's, if it's EU law, then it should be the Europeans who make the decisions and not the, not the others. But if we evacuate that notion of democracy, then already we can say maybe the urgency of that statement becomes a little bit less, uh, less clear. And, and then we, 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 we quite strongly emphasize two things. The first is that the Europeans are not weakly represented in international standardization right now. We are not lagging in any way. If, if, if you think about the place that European technology plays in the world and you compare it to the role that Europeans play in international standardization, Europeans are very well represented in international standardization. And one part of that, part of that is that the European standardization system is particularly well integrated with the international standardization system. The interface between the European standardization system and the international standardization system is smoother than for other regions in the world. The Europeans are more diligent in adopting international standards as, as European standards. And historically, European standards processes have been very open to international standards uh, uh, participants. So this is, this is what we see as a major success of the European standardization system, and we see it as the reason why European standardization system has been so good for European industry interests, but also for the European interests more broadly. So what are the elements where we're concerned about? I mean, what happens to those players that are considered not European under that statement? So there are two categories of players that would fall under that. One are the members of SEN, for example, that are national standards bodies of their countries, but they are not national standards bodies in the sense of Regulation 1025 because <coughs> they are not the national standards body of an EU member state. So we just had recently uh, a report by a parliamentary committee in the UK uh, feeling concern, expressing concern about British interests being excluded from certain processes in the European standardization system as a result of the changes brought about last year as a consequence of the strategy. And the other category, of course, is multinational corporations, which are specifically targeted in the strategy as having too much voice. We think that there is a geographic element to that as well. I mean, multinational companies, formally, that means a company that is established in different countries. So it's true that the current processes give a lot of leverage, and, and companies can play with the fact that they're in multi, multi, uh, multiple countries to be in multiple delegations and increase their voice. That's something that we might want to address. But Trying to, trying to say it's, it's important for us to diminish the role of these companies because they are multinationals, because they are not European players, is problematic and, and I think it doesn't serve the, 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 the EU values and it doesn't serve the, the interests of Euro, European industry. And uh, overarching theme or the overarching message for us is that Sure, there is a risk of fragmentation that has, the European Union has not created. The European Commission has not created the, the risk of fragmentation that we have now. It's, a, it's clear that this comes from outside. 
But if, if we are in that context, how do we navigate that context? I mean, uh, one, one response is to say, okay, let's, let's provide the European answer. Let's, let's, let's be also assertive of our interests. Or the other is to say, let's double down on our commitment to multilateralism. Let's, let's double down to our com on our commitment on the openness of the system to international participation. So uh, these are uh, the two. Uh, okay. Good. So I, I will uh, take over for the last two slides. I'm told we have five minutes. So um, to sum up, um, and if we take it now uh, at a broader level with the, the geopolitical uh, dimension, uh, we identified in the report this tension or this balance between the public and the private roles of the ESS and this risk of decoupling that would come from the fact that the ESOs have to deal with two different procedures and two procedures that are becoming more different, uh, the European uh, standards procedure and the other activities. Now, at the uh, international level, of course, this creates the risk that the ESOs have difficulties uh, keeping the connection that is so, uh, has been so fruitful and so good for Europe between the international dimension and the European uh, activities. Uh, now, there's also this idea that is suggested in, in the strategy of uh, kind of leveraging the global dimension to, to help uh, Europe uh, foster and, and promote its values at the global uh, level. Uh, and here, of course, there is a tension between fostering these values uh, and uh, fostering inclusiveness within the standardization process and the risk of fragmentation at global level. Um, so the first thing is we look at, well, what is the nature of the effect that is hoped? Is it some kind of Brussels effect that would go now not via legislation but via standardization? And, and here we, we say, well, we're not so sure that there's a Brussels effect that could be coming out of the standardization process in the sense that the standardization bodies are not doing legislation or regulation. Uh, they are not about this. They don't have a specific regulatory agenda, a specific <coughs> preference for a certain level of regulation. Rather, they receive a signal in that respect. And there is the possibility of division and fragmentation. So these are key elements of the success of the GDPR that may not be replicable uh, with standardization. Uh, so yes, it is good to be, uh, to take the initiative, uh, but uh, it may not work exactly uh, that way. Uh, there's a second dimension to uh, the global dimension of uh, the ESS, which is rather going in the opposite direction. It's the idea that by taking the initiative on, on standards, uh, we might produce uh, let's say, an industrial and economic ecosystem that is structured by standards and that leaves room, of course, for European firms to take a niche and be an actor within a standardized ecosystem, which is a, perhaps an easier task for European firms than becoming the next uh, giant. Uh, so um, I think there's a lot of to say for that strategy, but that strategy to work requires the standardization ecosystem at global level to continue to work uh, in an unfragmented way as much as possible. Uh, so when we put together these two risks, so the risks of decoupling that we create uh, two paths uh, within the standardization system and the risk of fragmentation, we came up with the four options that were already alluded to. Um, the first option is to us, Sorry, the option that is uh, in the uh, that arises more clearly out of the strategy, which is to to push the ESOs, the standards uh, bodies, to reform their processes, and, and here we we do think it creates both a high risk of decoupling and a risk of fragmentation. A second approach would be to. Uh, place European standards in a separate institution. So either we work with common specifications, so it's more driven by the political authorities, or maybe it could map out to a division between SEN and ETSI. So SEN is the place where European standards are done, and ETSI is more of a global standardization bodies in the uh, telecom and communications area. Um, I think in both scenarios, so the decoupling is perhaps outside of the ESOs, 
but the separate institutions, so the institutions that will end up being responsible for European standards, might suffer. Uh, they might be unattractive globally. So that brought us to the <clears throat> third option, which is to leave the ESOs as they are as much as possible and concentrate the effort on uh, improving the process of Article 10, so the mandates and the uh, assessment later on. Uh, this way, uh, the risk of decoupling is reduced. Uh, the coupling interface, if you want, is between the political and the technical realm. Uh, and the balancing between these competing, uh, competing objectives and conflicting objectives is done within the Article 10. Um, what's behind this is this idea that if there is a trade-off to be made between the policy values and uh, their technical realization, uh, this is a political decision. You know, is the standard good enough for European uh, values? Uh, it involves trade-offs. It is, you know, how, how far are we in the respect for fundamental rights? Is it at a good level? versus uh, we have a system that operates very well at international level for the benefit of European industry. These two things are in tension, and you have to make trade-offs. And we think these trade-offs should be done by political institutions. This is a political trade-off. Uh, so this is a bit the intuition behind the third option, which we put forward as our favorite, let's say, immediate option. Uh, but we put the fourth option as well, which could be a more daring but also more long-term option, which is to say, well, if there is a, a problem with the fit between the standards and uh, European public policy priorities, uh, maybe we need to expand the reach of eligible organizations. So rely more on the fact that there are many standardization fora and trust that one of them will produce a standard that is like what we would like to see in Europe and then use, again, political mechanisms to confer uh, value and strength uh, on that uh, standard. So this is the, the range of options that we put forward, and, and uh, I was glad to hear uh, from uh, MEP Bieland that uh, he agrees with us. The third option is the one that seems more uh, uh, preferable, in, certainly in the shorter term. So thank you uh, for your uh, patience. And thank you very much, uh, Pierre, um, and Justice. Um, for this very clear presentation, um, so the, the report again uh, is available on the website of SER, so you can find uh, it's a long report indeed, but thanks for this uh, very good um, uh, and crisp summary. So now we will have um, the panel uh, with the previous speakers, but also some new speakers and also um, online or on site if you have some question. Uh, after the brief intro of some of the members of the panel, I will take them. So uh, on site, as, uh, as I told you, you have a mic next to uh, your seat. And uh, online, you can raise your question via the Q&A um, function of Zoom. Okay, So don't hesitate um, for the people who are online uh, to ask your question. So first, um, you know uh, how we work at SER, we always try to involve uh, regulatory authority, um, companies, uh, and academics, so um, the, the panel, in a way, reflect um, that as well. Uh, uh, some, uh, uh, so the standardization um, body, the open standardization body, were um, in a way involved, uh, uh, gave input in the process, which were very useful, but also some companies, uh, which are disclosed uh, in the first uh, uh, page of the report. Uh, and uh, which are uh, Apple, Huawei, uh, Qualcomm, and then uh, um, Ofcom as a regulatory authority. So we will hear uh, from some of them in the panel. So what I have asked is if you can limit your intervention to three minutes maximum. And uh, one thing uh, you liked in the report and one thing uh, you think could have been improved. So let's start with you, Elena. Um, you are Director General of um, SEN and Senelec, so those are two very important uh, uh, standard, um, organiz European standard organizations. So um, what is your assessment, one thing you like, one thing you think could have been improved in the report? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you for organizing this event. I think that uh, it's very important to speak about the standardization. It's my passion, and I really enjoy to uh, um, have a lively debate uh, with uh, other uh, stakeholders. Uh, what I like of the report is that uh, it brings the value, the strategic value 
of standardization really to a level that uh, we were expecting from a long time. And uh, that is something that we also appreciate from the European standardization strategy. There is a strategic value that has been there that I think the European standardization bodies, SENS and LEC and ETSI, were aware of, but uh, uh, we didn't feel that it was uh, um, sufficiently recognized considering the um, um, use of uh, standards as a strategic tool for market access by other regions uh, in the world, and also by the value that we bring to the um, uh, single market. What I would have liked to uh, improve, I mean, uh, maybe I need to say that uh, Sense and Alec, uh, do not endorse the report, uh, and, and I think that my mm, message now is going to uh, also give some arguments for that. Uh, first, uh, I think that um, it would have been very useful to have a better understanding of the role of European standards for the single market. Uh, in the case of Sen and Senelec, we are regional bodies. Our raison d'etre is to support the single market. It was to support the single market. And we are talking here about 29 countries, the 27 of the Union and two EEA, part of the EEA EFTA countries. When, so there is no elaboration on the Sen Senelec governance which is completely misled in the report because, I mean, yes, Justin said that uh, the NSBs are not the recognized NSBs. This is not true. To become a Sense and Elect member, you need to be a recognized national standard body or a na recognized national electrotechnical committee. And this is in our rules. So we have got very clear rules. We have got peer assessments. And we verify that all the members of Sense and Elect fulfill very specific requirements that go beyond the WTO requirements to be recognized national standards bodies. So, I'm missing really the value of the single market. I'm missing the Sen and Elec governance. And uh, Sen and Sen Elec produce 95% of the harmonized standards. So there is a, a very clear distinction in the report about uh, the collection of standards that support public policies and the ones that do not. Uh, Senelec plays a very important role because uh, more or less 30% uh, uh, of the collection, 40% are harmonized standards, uh, which sometimes uh, I think that is not uh, sufficiently uh, um, highlighted uh, in, the, in the report. Uh, and actually, the value of the European standardization to support European policies is that once we publish a European standard, all the national standards bodies have got the obligation to adopt the standard and we throw national conflicting standards. And I haven't seen that reference at all in the report. That is completely eliminating technical barriers to trade uh, and ensuring that uh, there is free circulation of goods and services in the European single market. Uh, and um, there is a very strong commitment to the international standardization. I very much like the approach of, uh, yes, no fragmentation. That is the objective of the European standardization system. We are not, or we don't believe in standards as a business, but standards for business. Uh, what, uh, what we really appreciate is that uh, Experts uh, can devote their time, their energy in the place where they can produce a standard and that that standard is then bringing the value. They fit for purpose uh, to the industries that are working on that. Uh, finally, I also would like to highlight that uh, in terms of the amendment to the Regulation 1025, we have been using the national delegation principle for years. Uh, so yes, the amendment is going to introduce some changes, but uh, the national standards bodies are not those voting on the standards. Uh, these are the national mirror committees that represent all interested, interested parties. And I could elaborate a lot about democracy, but uh, if I suppose you have been contributing to a technical committee, I have been contributing to some technical committees. And uh, industry expertise as societal expertise, as SME's expertise, is absolutely wonderful. Because the wider participation, the better market acceptance. And that is the objective of producing a standards, European or international. <coughs> so I think that um, it's a very creative approach uh, to the European standardization system in the report. Uh, um, I would really like to, I would have liked to see further elaboration on the 
values that the European standardization bring to the single market that is not one country, that is 29 countries. And we really need to make sure that uh, we make life easier for all those that uh, want to market safe products and uh, secure products and environmental friendly products and interoperable products. Because I don't really believe in the separation of compatibility standards and safety standards because, sorry, I think this is also a little bit old fashioned. The world has changed. So a washing machine is an IT equipment. So th there is no differentiation in those standards anymore. And it's extremely important uh, to uh, evolve in the concept of uh, and the support that the standards can, uh, can provide to the, to the market. I, I have done my three minutes, so. Yes, okay. thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much enough for all those um, uh, useful comments. And I will give you the last word to the author uh, at the end of this uh, panel. Um, now we can go to Urska, um, if that's fine with you. Uh, Urska Petrovsky, she's Director of Economic Strategy at Qualcomm and um, was also involved in uh, providing input in the, in the drafting of the report. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for, share to, for having me here. It's a pleasure to be on this panel. So my experience, expertise lies really in the economic, legal and policy analysis. So my goal is to provide comments that focus on that aspect of the discussion. So in terms of what I like, or I would like to highlight of the report is, I think I appreciate very much the rigor that the authors have applied in preparing this report. It's clear that they have done a very detailed analysis of how the EU standardization process has evolved with time, how it's currently working, who are the main players, and this is reflected in the accuracy of the report. I think that this type of rigor is something that we often miss in academic papers, policy brief and unfortunately some of the inaccurate statement of how the standardization process work is sometimes repeated by courts or even in regulation. So this report is different. It provides a very helpful addition to the existing literature on standardization. And I believe it should be an essential reading for anyone that works on this topic but has never been involved in standardization activities. Now, based on Elena's comment, I think that some numbers might need to be revised, but I think it's definitely an extremely valuable research that has been added. I also like how the report makes the distinction between uh, the dual role, role of European standards. It emphasizes that some standards have the EU policy objectives, others are more directed towards the market. I think some of the numbers presented in the report really help to put things in context. It explains that uh, about a fifth of the standards are developed on the European Commission request and that none of the European standard organization focuses exclusively on developing European standards. At that in particular, the so-called European standards represent about 5% of all standards. And I think this is a dis distinction that is often missed in the policy discussion, but it's an, an important one and it has important implications. So these are like valuable things that one can find in the report. In terms of what I'm missing in the report is perhaps a more uh, of a constructive discussion of what should be done to achieve the European Commission objectives of the standardization policy. So the standardization policy say, says that European actors must be successful in international standardization for the, for the sake of European competitiveness and public policy objectives. And there is a lot of discussion in the report on what shouldn't be done, but few recommendations on what the Commission should do. And I believe it's important to acknowledge that at least when it comes to Etsy, several issues have been resolved. One example is the standardization request by the European Commission, which is a topic discussed in the report. The European Commission has expressed some concerns with the voting power of non-EU headquarter companies. And the report criticizes this definition of non-EU headquarter companies and argues that it's a bit difficult to define whether a company is European or not. 
And I'm not sure I'm convinced about this argument. Industry players make all the time this type of distinctions. They are able to differentiate between EU companies and non-European non companies. So I, I'm not sure I was persuaded by that part of the report. But more on a substantive point, I think that the solution that has been adopted so far is that national standards bodies will have a stronger role in this process. They will be in charge for deciding whether to accept the request, they will develop the program, but then the execution will be left to technical parties. And in that sense, both European headquartered companies and non-European headquartered companies will be able to participate and have a strong voice in the development of the standards. Of course, we have to see. We will have to see how this process will work out in practice. But so far, it seems a fair compromise. Another issue that seems to have been resolved is the voting issue, as outlined in the report. The European, European Commission has voiced concerns that some firms have acquired a lot of votes because the votes are distributed based on the contribution to the ETSI's budget. In in a way, it's like. Uh, pay for play. And with the changes that have been adopted to Etsy, now the, there will be a restriction on that. There will be a cap on the votes for corporate groups. And this will be an Etsy. My understanding is that that will not apply to the three GPP. And this seems a fair compromise too. There are other issues that need to be still resolved. One is the board composition, others is the appeal process. And here, perhaps, the report could provide more guidance to the Commission on what are the principles that it should follow when it's developing this solution. Perhaps it could emphasize that, you know, that the, the proposed solution should, uh, should remain true to, the, to a process that is democratic in a way, remind the Commission that the world is watching and that whatever solution the European Commission will adopt might be adopted by foreign standard development organization. So in that sense, the European Commission should really uh, aim at finding solutions that would not be controversial if adopted by foreign standard development organizations. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Orska, um, for those um, comments. Um, and again, I mean, the, the author will have the last word after uh, we do the tour. Um, so now let me turn to you, Michael. Um, you are in another company which is also um, taking standard very uh, seriously and very importantly, uh, Huawei. So what is your um, take on the report? Well, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Good morning, everyone. Uh, our our uh, fellow uh, co-panelists uh, and also audience uh, present and online. I unfortunately didn't have the possibility to be with you there in Brussels. Uh, I, I say just a few words on the report as such, and then I also try to highlight one or two, uh, two uh, important factors in my view. There are many important things to highlight, in fact. Uh, the report as such, I find it extensive, comprehensive, and in fact, also very informative and educational, especially looking at the first couple of chapters where we go through, uh, where it goes through the approach uh, of NLF, uh, the new approach, uh, the TBT principles, and of course, also the duality nature of a standardization and its ecosystem, the private public nature, and the aspects of market driven uh, voluntary standards versus. Uh, standardization as an important tool to implement European po um, policy and regulation. Uh, also, chapters three or four, very important topics on governance, geopolitics, um, raising some important issues. Uh, I also want to use the opportunity to mention that we truly appreciate and welcome the standardization strategy as it raised the bar on importance, on the strategic importance of standardization and uh, encouraging a continuous leadership role that Europe has to play in standardization. Uh, and also Mr. Bielen's report, uh, the INI report, we appreciate that very much also as, as I believe personally that it does address uh, some of the industry and industrial stakeholders' uh, concerns and, and views as well. Now to just quickly highlight maybe one or two points on the report, as I said, there are many, but. One thing that I appreciated a lot is the fact that it highlights the issues with some of the inefficiencies in the system. 
Uh, I must uh, say that in my view, the standardization strategy itself maybe did not focus too much on that. Uh, even though in the aftermath of the standardization strategy, I believe commission together with the ESOs are putting efforts in, in handling that. And I mentioned the issues regarding the citation of harmonized standards in the journal and the effect of the court ruling James Elliott and all that, and the interpretation of that has consulted. We have been talking about that. The slowness, the delay it has created, this truly is a source of frustration for us in the industry. Mr. Muller actually uh, mentioned that. I appreciate that, Sophie. Uh, and, but this is important, and I really appreciate uh, Ms. Muller's effort and Ms. Santiago's effort, because I know you two are personally involved, in fact, in, in solving some of these issues, and we from industry truly appreciate that. Uh, the other, uh, quickly, uh, point that I want to mention is the fact that the report brings up that the, the, the attention to this principle of international standards first and the transposition of international standards to the, to the European norms. And, and if international standards don't exist, that ESO should really request ISO, IEC to jointly develop it with them. This, this is actually what helps the European competitiveness in the world. And I know that uh, since Enleg and Ms. Santiago are very much through the, through the um, uh, Vienna and Frankfurt agreements uh, um, are following that principle. But I think it's very important that we do not forget this aspect, which, which, which is very important to European enterprises and, and SMEs. Uh, but also I wanna say that this in itself and this emphasis on international standards and alignment of European standards with international standards also requires international collaboration with all parties. And it requires us to truly avoid fragmentation, regionalization, and decoupling, which we see a risk of happening now. And uh, standards, uh, I mean, in excluding certain players uh, to their location of headquarters or however we define it, I wouldn't say at this stage is helpful and productive to this concept. Uh, and I would advise against that. Um, I, I'm not sure if I have any more time. If not, I will stop here. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much, Michael, for this. And now the, the last panelist who didn't spoke so far, and then I will come back to, to Sophie and Adam if they uh, wanted to react of what they have heard so far. And that is Jerry from um, Ofcom. Yeah, thank you very much, and um, uh, thank you for having me here, and apologies that I, I couldn't be there in person. Um, and you'll have to forgive me for coming to the, the question of the report, not just as an employee of a regulator, but as someone who's worked in the standardization process for over 20 years, predominantly through Etsy. Um, and of course, my comments are political. It's very much an in industry and engineering practice um, uh, observation in, in many ways. Um, so it is really good the report recognizes the value of international standards that just happen to be made in Europe. Uh, and, you know, Etsy provides a really good example of, uh, of, of a forum where that happens very successfully. And um, you know, I, I personally have supported international standards built on the back of EU directives, but they very much end up with a, a global application. Um, and that's, that's a very implicit item that I think we started to see drawn out in that report. Um, the report, it correctly highlights that successful technical standardization of a global undertaking. And it's this insight, you know, the likes of, uh, and again, forgive me for uh, commenting in Etsy, but that's the one I know best. It's best positioned to um, to bring out to that European standardization system. Um, it also highlights the drawbacks and potential pitfalls of limiting the global nature of European technical standardization and a, there are many good reminders in there as to how successful this system has been in, in, in achieving its aims and that we don't try to impose national boundaries upon it but instead continue to pursue the historical approach to European standardization that comes with open and pluralistic um, engagement. In terms of items that we might want to improve or draw out, um, as, a, as a steering group member we're supportive of the conclusions that uh, um, have been arrived at in the report, including the ultimate policy recommendations concerning the streamlining of Articles 10 and 11 of uh, 
Regulation 1025 um, as, a, as a means to reach the balance between the two roles of the European standardization strategy. While it's not necessarily an improvement, we are curious as to what the researchers had in mind in terms of how that streamlining might be achieved or approached. And that's, that's definitely something we might look at too in the future. Thank you. I think that should be uh, less than three minutes, I hope. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Indeed, it was even less, I think. Um, so, um, I don't know if there are some questions um, in the room uh, that you want to ask. Yes, if you can just present yourself. I have one question also, uh, two questions, one comment and one question online that I will mention, but um, please. I don't know if the mic works. Uh, uh, no, no, it works. Yeah. Heinz Borsa, Deutsche Telegram, responsive for standards, patents and open source program office. Um, I have a question, maybe on the whole panel, about the power of NSOs. Um, what we are here doing, giving decision power to the NSOs, who decides then if a standard should be done. But the standard itself then is done by an experts in the standardization organizations, so by totally different people. How can it work that one decides that another one should do the work who might not be interested in doing the work. Okay, um, I will collect if there are other questions in the interest of time. So thanks a lot for this. Yes, please, again, present yourself and ask a question. It's rather a comment, so maybe you want to address the question first. No, 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 I will collect everything because otherwise... Okay. Uh, and then uh, I will group my the name question. is uh, Maitane Olavarria. I'm from Small Business Standards. That is precisely one of these organizations mentioned in the report representing the interest of uh, small businesses, SMEs. More than a question is a comment. Uh, I have to say that uh, since the report was published quite recently, I didn't have the time to go into the, the details. But indeed, I have the sensation there is a bit of confusion as well when I see the, the options as well that I see at the end. Um, as Elena said, I think an important element is to mention that uh, a European standard, whether it's harmonized or not, actually, uh, once adopted, basically has the obligation for national standards bodies to withdraw national standards and um, basically adopt this European standard. So it's a big foundation for the internal market. Another point that was mentioned was kind of made a difference for me. All standards are made by the mar for the market in the sense that at the end are made for companies that will apply them whether to comply with uh, regulation or whether to comply with other kind of uh, technical uh, requirements. And I think this is important to, um, to be mentioned. I've, I was a bit confused about this notion of representation. And I was a bit astonished as well, actually, to hear that just made the concern known and let others to bring. Um, I'm not so sure that would, would work. I don't know if the, the people that wrote the report have ever w been in a technical committee and been in, a, in the development of a standard, but you would realize that there are a whole series of comments that the committee and the experts have to go through. And of course, if there is nobody there to defend that comment and to explain what that comment is or why it was made, it will be um, quite difficult for this comment to be understood and actually achieve the change that maybe might be necessary necessary to make that standard applicable as well for an SME that, of course, has the interest to apply standards because they are also part of uh, the supply chain. So uh, letting other stakeholders different comments of SMEs, I'm not sure is the best uh, approach. I would like a multinational to do it, to make their comment and let others to. I don't think they would be doing that precisely because of that. So I think representation and having a balanced representation is important to make the standards acceptable widely used, because the more interest they represent and the, uh, the better uh, the standard will be and will be uh, used. And I think uh, the representation of SMEs is also important because we should not forget that they are a bigger part of the market. <coughs> and actually, they also have difficulties because of their less resources they have to get involved in standardization. So I think the role of uh, is important, and I will uh, just uh, finish by saying that regarding the options, I think they fail to consider that since 
and Etsy uh, have different roles in the sense that they are divided by sec sector they cover. So this kind of option saying that one should be dealing with harmonized standards, the other not, I don't think is feasible. And finally, having a multiplication of standards bodies, I also don't think, uh, like they have in the American system, competing among them, I don't think would be the best option favorable for SMEs that would have to actually get involved in many more bodies and they already have problems to follow the standardization work. Thank you very much for, for bringing the, the view of the SME, which are, of course, very important in that debate. Uh, yes, please. Hopefully, use another mic. Hopefully, yeah, it will we'll, be better. We'll give it a try. Nerea Ruiz, ECOS, Environmental Coalition on Standards, the environmental representative in, within the European standardization system. Uh, more a comment than a question. Also, some immediate... <laughs> Maybe. OK, let's try. So, uh, immediate reactions uh, on some points that have been presented today. Obviously, I also have not had enough time to check the full report, but will do, certainly. Uh, first of all, to mention that uh, um, we have a tendency to also forget the uniqueness of the European standardization system and how we should be praising some of the very valid elements therein, as in, for example, the recognition of the unbalanced representation. So, this is something unique to the European standardization system. It is not recognized as such, or at least the inclusiveness element of it, it's not recognized as, as such in any other standardization systems. And instead of uh, being critical about what's behind, I would also recommend people to praise these kind of very good elements that could also be used globally as a best practice. So why not competing globally based on these kind of elements that are working uh, already in Europe? Not saying that they are working perfectly yet, but we are all together trying to uh, uh, make them work better. Um, to uh, the comment uh, on this, uh, whether the four interests recognized in the regulation should be four, less, more. Uh, well, the four interests recognized currently are all equally necessary. We may have some com common grounds, obviously, and we do, and we cooperate together, but also we represent constituencies with very different interests, as in, I can speak for the uh, environmental ambition, the European environmental ambition, again, one more of those uh, competitive or uh, advantages that uh, Europe should be looking into, but then the environmental interest that I represent and my members at national level are not necessarily as knowledgeable or as experts on the SME reality, the consumer reality, and so on. So all equally necessary. And um, I, I sense from also other speakers how uh, the report tends to focus on the threats, fragmentation. So on, on the negative side of the things, this is my feeling. I may have a different feeling after uh, having read through it, but I also would invite the authors to also focus on those opportunities, as I was saying at the beginning. As Elena mentioned, if uh, uh, or when people, as I did also before, uh, took part in uh, expert work within technical committees and working groups, there is also this sense of an extremely uh, uh, valid added value that uh, societal stakeholders and SMEs bring to the table because what we are trying to do is to uh, have different expertise represented in the room. We are technical experts. We are not there with any uh, other uh, mission in the room. We are technical experts as anybody else. And there are many instances, and I could go on with many examples, and if you want to have a follow-up discussion, we're more than happy to uh, have that, on, on how environmental experts, for instance, uh, have helped uh, the working group in thinking outside the box. Because as we are saying, we are uh, immersed in an industrial transformation when we are uh, uh, speaking about green transition, how, how could one think of not having environmental experts in the room? At least this is my take. And uh, what I'm also sensing is that there are some sort of risks that you see from this representation of underrepresented stakeholders. And I would also welcome to understand a bit more whether you really see threats from us being in the room when everything that we are doing is added value to the technical discussions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, yeah, maybe a last question, but very quick. Huh? Um, two, two questions, but very quick, because um, otherwise we will not have time to eat. <laughs> um, yes, please go ahead. No, it doesn't work. This mic doesn't work. There's a, supposed to be a button or something. No. Another one. 
Okay, maybe you can ask your question and then when you mean while you, yeah. Yes, Hello. yes, it works. Uh, hi, the, uh, thanks uh, for the invitation. And uh, I'm a student from Antwerp Management School, currently interned at Sen and Senelec, and I'm researching on the topic of uh, emerging sectors which are crucial for green and digital transition. So as so Sophie mentioned about uh, the chat GPT and the various standards that will be crucial uh, for uh, you know taking respect of the labor rights in coming times. Uh, but if we think about uh, chat GPT and the AI per se, uh, it has a huge societal implication. And I was reading the commission's white paper and it says that they want to see artificial intelligence having European and liberal values. And today we discussed about labor rights as well. So my question is that do you think if we move too much in the standardization in artificial intelligence and chat GPT, the scope of innovation will decrease. And second, uh, in which direction you want to see the standards because uh, you know we want to take chat GPT and AI into a European and liberal uh, direction, but at the same time, it's a technology which is available all around the world and uh, our way of thinking and living and our views might not match with people living in some other part of the world. Thank you very thank much. You. Uh, thank you very much. And the last Can question. Yes, we do. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for the presentation of the report. There seems to be a common understanding. Could you just present yourself so we know? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm very sorry. My name is Katrin Bink and I'm working for the ETOC, which is the European Trade Union Confederation. <coughs> we represent uh, workers in unions and standardization. Thanks. So there's a common understanding that we should, um, we should have society in standardization to let them participate and to have an influence on the standard that we write. Uh, but at the moment, it's a lip service because the reality is much more different. So it is all in the regulation. It's all somewhere. Every time we speak about it, it's all there. But when you look at national level, we do not participate. There are many, many barriers for us, for the unions to participate. And we're just about to publish a report um, giving more facts and findings on that. There are many different reasons. But the bottom line is we're not involved. But something needs to be done. We're not there yet. So really to have a standard or standard European standardization system reflecting the broad views of society, we're not yet there. So much more needs to be done um, because standardization or participation, participating in standardization starts at national level. You're not involved in national level. It will be very difficult to, to put your voice forward at European and international level. And what we also use very commonly is saying, yeah, but it's a democratic process because we are building standards by consensus. And it's true, but we're building consensus of the people that sit at the table. And not everyone makes it to the table to build a consensus. And because, and it has been said earlier by Justin Baron, standardization organizations are expert bodies. They're not the legislators, the expert bodies. And everybody who participates in standardization meetings knows that the, the standard is being written by the experts. They do not, in the meetings, have to be in compliance with national positions. The position of the expert, the personal view of the expert, is what is written down in standards. And when you go to standardization meetings, you have Huawei Germany, Huawei France, Huawei Spain, and these are not necessarily representing the view of European society. So, two reflections I would like to give forward is first one, much more needs to be done to have real inclusiveness at national level. And we need to be careful with what can be dealt with and by standards. There is a reason why standards have been dealing with mainly technical issues and there's a reason why legislators are dealing with more issues that should be dealt with by legislation. We should not shift or outsource issues, for example, dealing with fundamental rights to standardizations, because standardization are the expert bodies, and this is not what we have with the legislators. So we should be very carefully thinking about what should be dealt with by standardization and what should be left within the arena of, uh, of the European Union legislator. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, we are about to close. So what I will do, so 
first I will um, mention the comment that I received online, then uh, Sophie will have uh, some minutes to react on what she heard and then the last word to the author. So um, one uh, uh, comment was Chiara Giovanni from ANEC and she also mentioned the importance of the civil society and, and uh, consumer uh, in the standardization body and she mentioned the contribution they did to the Adair Lovelace uh, Institute report on standardization that will be discussed later uh, in the afternoon. And then uh, an, uh, a question by uh, Olia uh, from uh, the University of Utrecht, which come back to this issue of the relationship between national standardization body and European standardization body. And the question to the author is whether we should also focus on reforming the, given, the governance of those national institutions. So, so basically, from what I understand, there are two main broad issues which are discussed. Is what is the inclusiveness of the uh, European standardization body and should it be uh, uh, more inclusive than they are today uh, and the second question is the relationship and that came in on different sex uh, different question the relationship between the mandate but also um, the governance of those national body and, and the European body uh, but uh, Sophie you talk about whatever you want uh, <laughs> but you know I don't I didn't know very much about standardization but it's not an easy topic from what I understand um, so good luck. <laughs> Thank you. Well, obviously it's not easy, otherwise it wouldn't be fun. And I think today um, we have heard also a lot of different perspectives. And you know, European Commission tries to find the space in the middle, right? We, uh, we're here to, um, yeah, to listen and to try to then make the right choices. I would have one comment um, based on the presentation and the things uh, we heard as well. I have a bit the impression that in the report some aspects were either overthought or overinterpreted, <coughs> and then leading to some as assumptions on um, uh, that we are decoupling and so on. The first that you know we are bringing in a democratic process into the standards development bodies, and then the second um, that uh, we have a stance uh, on multinationals, um, and that we wanted uh, or that leads to a certain decoupling. I think here I want to take a step back because the first thing is. What is the objective? And we have heard it from some people in the audience. Representation, technical expertise, leads to better standards. And we want the broadest possible technical expertise in the committee. When we talk about multinationals, no one does not want to have not multinationals in the room. Of of course, we want to keep them. And I'm very happy that um, Qualcomm also uh, came in to say that uh, because a lot of these issues uh, circle around Etsy, that um, number one, we're not disrupting the process in Etsy. Number two, um, it's deemed as a good compromise. And number three, basically we want to broaden the technical inputs. So this is number one, and this is where I want to um, make a clear stance. The second point is decoupling. Well, where are we coming from? We're coming from our EU legislation when the European Commission becomes active, either from EU legislation or EU policy. The rest is a purely driven stakeholder process. Now, maybe we're decoupling with our EU laws. That could be, but this is based on democracy. This is based on what the European citizens want the European institutions to act on, on artificial intelligence, on data, on, on our net zero industrial emissions uh, um, objectives. And of course there will be a tension at international level. Of course this leads to a certain amount of decoupling. But I do think that we can bring our stance in and then work on a good compromise. In an ideal world, yes. And this is why, for example, we did the AI standardization request, which is so linked, closely linked to the JTC21 work and ISO and IEC, um, to uh, the respective bodies to have these very close interlinkages. But um, we are probably the last region that wants to decouple because uh, otherwise we would not have, sometimes, I'm, I'm honest, no, very, very difficult free trade negotiations uh, with our regions to bring a commitment to ISO, IC, and ITU. To bring a commitment to the WTO principles. Now in the TTC, a commitment from the US 
that we have common technical specifications on both sides of the Atlantic, which will remove the TBT to bring more representation. We're having these discussions with the Americans on uh, broader representation. So I do think, um, yeah, maybe your report went a little bit over the top. Provocation is never bad. Um, it gets us thinking. But, um, you know, for the policy process, we might go maybe a step back again to uh, come to a level playing field. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sophie. Um, and now the last word to the author, um, Pierre and Justice, you, okay. the order you like. Maybe uh, I'll, I'll have a, a first go and, and then the, my co-author will, will follow. So I, I, I welcome all the, the comments, uh, especially the, the positive ones. But uh, uh, as uh, academics, we're, we're not used to spend a lot of time on the positive stuff. We go to the critical stuff. So I think it, this is an answer to a number of the comments. <laughs> uh, we are well aware of, of how uh, of the importance of standards for the single market. We may not have underlined it enough in the report, but you know we do like academics do. We spend our time on the points that we think are worth uh, maybe rethinking or, or, or uh, reframing. Uh, so uh, we, uh, we are aware of, of the role of, of SEN for the single market, the effect on, on uh, national standards. But as was mentioned, uh, we're moving in an era where there, like on AI, I don't think there will be a lot of displacement of national standards. It's really about the, the standard that is done at EU level will be constitutive of, uh, of the, uh, the industry uh, to a large extent. Uh, the point about uh, EU and non-EU headquarters company, I think our point is not so much that the criterion is not workable. It is workable. That's not the point. It's the choice of criterion as opposed to other alternatives and the balance with other areas in EU law where a distinction uh, is, uh, is made. And uh, again, all the, the reactions from our, our, our colleagues in the uh, various uh, groups that uh, represent uh, interests in the standardization process. Uh, no, we're not saying that uh, these groups should not be there. Quite to the contrary, they have to be there. We, we see the argument uh, very well. The point that we're making in the report is what is the function? What is the model? Uh, if the aim is to have some kind of democratic process, then we're saying, well, maybe we need to look at this more closely. Uh, but the aim that's always been there and, and that justifies amply the presence of all the representatives at the table is an epistemological aim. And as, as we heard and that is clear to us, you need to have people from uh, SMEs, uh, uh, also from labor, environment, uh, consumer representatives at the table making the point so that the information is present and it is part of the discussion. Uh, there's no question about this. Our question was more, well, what exactly are we doing? Improving the quality of the standard, for sure. Uh, are we moving towards something that looks more like a democratic process? Then we need to, to think about it more closely, we would uh, argue. And uh, uh, yeah, that's, that's it from my side. Thank you. Uh, Justice. And use your mic, please. Uh, put, yes. your mi put, put your mic on. So similar to Pierre, I, we, I would thank uh, the audience and the panelists for, for the comments. I mean, we always learn from, <coughs> from the criticism, so we will take that to heart. I, I wanted to acknowledge um, the comments from Elena, and I, I think what you have sensed, and I think that it's quite obvious from the report, is that we are at home mostly in, in Etsy and, and its environment, yeah. and, and I think that is also true to some extent of the people that we spoke with. So, uh, uh, clearly, I mean, we understand that Sen and Senelec, they account for actually much larger numbers of standards, of, of, the, of, of course, of the standards that we talk about here and in, 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 with respect to EU legislation. But I think there's one justification to the focus on Etsy in the, in the depth at which we go in the analysis, which doesn't obviously mean that we shouldn't do our best efforts to correctly describe Sen as well, but like it's, I, I think that it's probably a true to say that the the strategy and the, and the discussions that it triggered and the changes that it triggered have been more profound for Etsy. It's yeah. so it's it's been more incremental at Sen than it has been at Etsy. So I think that it's something that even though Etsy is actually a small share of the standards that are concerned, 
it's it's been it's been at the focus of the discussion. So I think that this is partly explains and hopefully a little bit excuses our, our focus on on that particular organization and our lack of depth on on the others. Um, on the other next three organizations, I think we we apparently hit a nerve or kind of. Uh, came across as criticizing the role that these organizations currently play in the system. And, and, and I don't think that we, we do that. I don't think, we certainly don't intend that. So it's, 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 we, we acknowledge it as a, as a core feature of, of, of European standardization. And I think that it's, it's also for the people from the system, from the NXT organizations, there's a conceptual difficulty. There's a conceptual difficulty in, in, in squaring the notion of balance, where we have like, okay, we, we, we have uh, different particular interests, and then we bring general interest organizations which are different. They are conceptually different. They are, they are different in, in the means that they have. They're different in the tools that they can use. And so um, it has always been uh, a constant a constant re revisiting, a constant rediscussion of the way how we represent these general interests in the European standardization system. And every single strategy document over the decades has been probably the, the most important theme. And it has been discussed and it has always cons consistently been criticized. Consistently, the, the current status quo has been described as <coughs> inadequate, as lacking, as failing. So like it's, it's, it's clear, I, I think we can agree that there are just conceptual differences, it's just conceptually inherently difficult to do that in a satisfactory way. And that doesn't mean that we think that you're not doing it right or that we think that the system is, is, is wrong or completely misguided. We just think that it's conceptually difficult. And then like it's, what we hope to make is this conceptual contribution about, okay, let's, let's think about representation, what representation means in different contexts and how it translates into standardization policy. And where we, where we, where we see these notions, I mean, we, we see the word democracy popping up and maybe we took it too far, maybe. But I, I think we, we, we connect it with elements of the strategy, we connect it with policy elements, which lead us to think that there is a push towards making it more about representativity, which is different from representation. It's different from this notion of, we need guys like you in the room, who, are, who have the expertise, who have the knowledge. Of course we don't say, make your comment and then please leave it to the others. Of course not. I mean, I, I, don't, think we, I don't think we write that. And, and what, what we do say is that it's, it's in, a, in, an apolitical context, in an apolitical standardization system, the, uh, the weight that a comment gains is not because of who is represented. It's because of the substance of the comment itself. And, and this is obviously only works when all the relevant comments are made. It only works, as you say, it doesn't work when large and important constituencies are excluded, but it doesn't mean that we, that we need to engineer a, a, an assembly style kind of decision making process where, where, we, where we apply this notion of representative uh, decision making. So it, it, I, I, don't think we, I don't think we take aim particularly at the current process. We, what we take aim at is the element that we perceive, uh, the, the call for action in, 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 in a particular direction, taking the system in a particular direction, where we say, okay, given that standards are becoming more and more like that, we need more and more of that. And where we basically say, like, it's uh, uh, these elements of democracy that we see here, we, we, we express our concern with that. And then on the, on the sexual dist uh, um, distinction or separation between Etsy and Sen and Sen, like, sure. But I mean, that doesn't contradict what we have also heard that the, there's a blurring line, there's an increasing number of fields in which there is a choice, in which, in which uh, different organizations could be recipient of standardization requests. We have seen discussions about uh, people noting, noticing or discussing that Etsy did not receive certain requests that they might have also qualified for receiving. So I think it's not, uh, it's not clear cut, okay, that from now on Etsy is excluded, but I think that there's an increasing number of topics where there is a choice whether it's given to one, it's given to both, or it's given, it's given to, uh, to all three of them. But it's, it's, uh, so I, I don't think that it's completely off tech to say that just because they work in different fields, we, we never have that choice. And, and I think with that, we, we take the comments home, we, we do our work, and we hope to 
have other opportunities to connect and speak to the next project. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for, for the panelists. Uh, I'm sorry that we are a bit over time. So um, just in, in closing this, I mean, I think it's an interesting discussion which will continue, uh, I guess, over lunch and maybe later on. So, um, th so we will have a lunch. I hope we can um, uh, start the, the second part a little bit later because we start so at least people have at least 45 minutes to eat. Um, then so there is the second part, which l the lunch will be served over there. Um, the second part will be here again uh, on a standard essential patent, which is a more focused topic. Um, I would like to first to thank uh, all the, the panelists, um, Sophie, uh, the MEP Bilan, um, and uh, also all the others from the industry and from uh, from the authority, uh, from the standard. Uh, a body uh, and of course the authors. Uh, we um, have other event at CER, huh? so the, the next one is a member-only event where we will discuss with uh, Guillaume Loriot from DG Competition on a merger in, uh, in telecom, media and uh, tech industry and then in um, you were talking about AI but you should come back, we have an event in, um, in, uh, next in June on, uh, where we will present a, a report on, uh, on AI in, in particular. Okay, so thank you very much to the CER team for having organized all that. Uh, I know all those events are not easy to organize, so some are there, some are over here. And now have a bon appétit, everyone, and um, see you uh, for the second part of the event in uh, 45 minutes. Thanks very much.